Hello, we are beginning Search for Truth Bible Study. I'm using Search for Truth Bible Study charts number two. I will be looking once in a while at Search for Truth. This was the first one that came out. And what we will be doing is we will be going from Genesis to Revelation. And we will be looking at some of the basic things throughout so that anybody after going through this course will be able to, if someone's talking about David, they'll kind of be able to zero in. Well, that's Old Testament. That was one, that was Kings. Uh, and they'll be able to uh, help them understand what is being preached. And uh, that is very important. That's why Bible studies are so important because what we teach enables the preachers to do a greater uh, job in reaching people because they already have an understanding. So with that, I want to remind everybody that if you're on Facebook, please share. And if you're on YouTube, uh, share plus subscribe. Thank you for doing that for me. Uh, with that, let's pray and ask God to bless this study. We love you, Lord. We praise you. You're a mighty God. We thank you for your presence here, for helping us, Lord. Teach us, God, to show us the way. Help us to open our heart when we open up the Bible today. Help us, Lord, to see what you want us to see. We're asking in your name. We can do nothing without you. We thank you, Lord, for blessing, touching, and anointing this lesson. In your name, amen. Search the scriptures, they are they which testify of me. Jesus says the, the Bible is important. When we look at the Bible, we look at the fact that the Bible has two basic parts to it. There's an Old Testament and there's a New Testament. If we look at about, well, the uh, Old Testament in relationship to the New Testament, I'm, I better do it like this so you, I won't have all my notes showing there, but uh, so you can see a little bit better. But the Old Testament right here uh, versus the New Testament, uh, the Old Testament is like four-fifths of the Bible, and the New Testament is one-fifth of the Bible. Uh, so there's, uh, the Old Testament is very, very important. A lot of people say, well, we're in the New Testament. We no longer need the Old Testament. Uh, they don't realize that when Jesus and the apostles first started preaching, they didn't have a New Testament. All they had was the Old Testament, and that's how they reached people. The Old Testament helps us to understand the New Testament, and once we read the New Testament, we'll go back and we'll have a better understanding of the Old Testament that all works together. So with that, <coughs> let's move on. Uh, an amazing book, the Bible is easy enough for the simplest person to understand, yet it is profound enough for the greatest scholars to spend a lifetime trying to figure it out. That's a thought. Who am I? How did I get here? What's my purpose in life? Mankind has pondered these and other questions from the earliest times of civilization. Something in each one of us desires the purpose of existence. We all want to discover and fulfill our specific place in the church and world. The Bible written by the one who created us is the only book that can provide the answers for us. A tremendous testimony to the impeccable character and truth of the Bible is its continued life-changing impact upon the lives of those who read and obey it. I, I used to uh, tell people a lot, you got to read the Bible, you got to read the Bible. And then I realized, I'm missing something there. You've got to read it and obey it if you really want to make a difference in your life. It's the greatest manual for living, provides both direction and purpose, the most practical self-improvement book, and the most inspiring positive mental attitude book ever written. The Primacy of the Word. No one can live successfully for Jesus Christ apart from their daily eating of His Word and the resulting interactions from the Holy Ghost promptings into all truth and the words piercing even to the dividing and asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. 
a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's Hebrews 4.12. The creative God, the saving God, the loving God, the merciful and graceful God invites us from every book in His Word to surrender to His loving kindness and His provision paid for with His blood. I, even I, am He that blotted out uh, thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. He says, I will remember your sins no more. If we ask for forgiveness, if we repent of our sins, if we ask forgiveness, we won't have to be ashamed when we become before him. We won't be embarrassed by what we've done because he says, I will remember your sins no more. That's just one of many scriptures where he's saying the same thing, that he will remember our sins no more. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The Bible is a composite of 66 books. This is one book, but it's composed of 66 books written by 40 writers over a period of 1,500 years. For the most part, the writers are unknown to each other, yet perfect harmony and unity exist in the Bible. There are no contradictions or errors in it. I was about, well, I was 23 years of age when I came to truth. And of course, God directed me. He, uh, he even spoke to me at one point. He says, uh, read the Bible. And so, uh, having not really known him, the Bible was a whole new thing to me. And I saw how uh, perfect it was and how it could answer all my questions. And I remember uh, I got baptized in Jesus. I repented. I got baptized in Jesus' name. I received the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues. And shortly after that, me and a person that was working very closely with me, we went to uh, a coffee shop. And at the coffee shop, we met some people that were going to a, 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 a seminary. And they started talking with us, and they started telling me there's contradictions in the Bible. And I says, contradictions? I was brand new. I was just getting into the Bible, but everything I'd read, it was click, click, click. It, it was right on. And I said, no, it couldn't be any contradictions. And I says, what do you consider a contradiction? They told me uh, uh, the contradiction that was a big one, one in their life. Okay, I says, give me a week. I'll be back here in a week. And so I went and I started going from person to person in the church. And I says, what does this mean? What does this mean? And I finally got my answers. And I was back there that next week. And when they showed up, I showed them there's no contradictions in the Bible. I told them that uh, what the answer was, and of course they were all amazed because their teachers were telling them there's contradictions in the Bible. No, there's no contradictions. Well, I should say there's no contradictions in the King James Bible because I have found contradictions in some of the versions that are coming out. So with that, why? 2 Peter 1.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God wrote it. That's why. He was able to get all these people from different places who didn't even know uh, each other to write a perfect book, perfect harmony, perfect unity, no contradictions, no errors. From God's hand to ours, uh, it was a, the f- Ten Commandments were the first written covenant, and of course God Himself uh, wrote the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stones. When Moses broke the first t- tablets that were given him, God made him carve out uh, two more stones so that He could once again put the Ten Commandments uh, into those stones. The first 2,500 years, there was no written word until, of course, the Ten Commandments. The Word of God came orally uh, through creation and conscience. No, orally, God talked with people. Creation, uh, Romans chapter 1 talks about the fact that we should be able to look at God's creation and know that there is a God. 
Uh, it, it's, it's a, <laughs> what a creation, and everything fits together. And only one God could have done it because if there was more than one God out there, it would have never worked together like it's working together. Conscience. A lot of people say, God's never talked to me. And I think about conscience. I says it's a still, small voice. And people know what's right and what's wrong. That If they listen to their conscience. Of course, uh, you can get to a place where you sear it and, and close it off from yourself. But God gives us a conscience to help us to come closer to him. The law is preserved. The, the Bible says that the t Ten Commandments were put into the Ark of the Covenant. And, and of course, uh, when we think of uh, a movie where Charles Heston comes down the mount with these huge uh, stones. Well, they were actually about, oops, they were actually just small because they had to fit into the Ark of the Covenant. Also, the book of the law in Deuteronomy 31, 24, 26 was put into the sides of the Ark of the Covenant, meaning the Pentateuch. That was the basic law at that time. The entire law was put into the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, a lot of people, we talk about commandments and those. They'll say, uh, yeah, there's the Ten Commandments. But they don't realize that there's more commandments than the Ten Commandments. That's why the whole book of the law was put in there, so that we can see that there's many commandments. And the Ten Commandments was just a starter. It was a, uh, it was a moral law. It was a basic thing that helped us to start turning around. But as we come closer to God, there's other commandments that we have to obey. There is... Uh, a scripture, it's in Matthew 24, I accidentally, and it says, 22, and it says, uh, well, let me go back to uh, 21. For then shall be great tribulations, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. What that's saying is that things are getting worse out in the world. I don't know if you've looked around or read the news, see what's going on. Things are it's total chaos out there. Uh, we're like in the days of the judges. Every man was doing right, what was right in their own eyes. It says it's going, to get keep, it's going to keep getting worse and worse. We're seeing the beginning and the end. We haven't seen the tribulation yet, but when the tribulation comes, uh, that would be the culmination of everything that's going on right now. We're just <coughs> seeing the beginning of the end. And it says, unless those days be shortened, no man will be saved. Whoa. Uh, this is a time, this is the hour, more than any that we have ever seen. That we better get into the Word of God. We better know the Word of God. And it goes on talking about um, uh, false Christ and false prophets, teachers. Uh, they'll work great signs and wonders and people will be led away. We better know the Bible so that won't be us. Uh, there's coming a time where he will have to come or because no flesh could be saved in what was taking place on this earth. The scribes copied the law in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is, I mean, uh, the work that was put into preserving it was unbelievable. Scribes did it. And they would spend hours and hours uh, copying it. There was uh, several scribes working together. One would speak the letter that had to be uh, written. Another would write it, and another a third would come and check and see if it was correct. Later, when the whole page was done, they would read it, and if there was one error in it, they'd have to rip up the page and start all over again. So there was tremendous attention to detail in making sure that every word of the Old Testament was put uh, in exactly as it had been given to them from the beginning. The entire law was read every seven years. That means someone about seven years old has 
heard the, it, the Bible, the law at that time was the Pentateuch, the first original books that were written by Moses, but the, the law, uh, they would have uh, read the entire law minimum of uh, 10 times in their 70 years in existence, if it was every seven years. The first Bible printed was in uh, 1488. It was on the uh, Gutenberg Press. And of course, with that, the Word is now in our hands. The Bible is unique and wonderful. More translations than any other book. Uh, it's unbelievable on how the Bible has been preserved, but then translations made. Uh, almost every country in the world, I believe, has uh, translation of the Bible, so everyone has access to the Bible today. It's a survivor of time and critics. There are so many through time that have totally wanted to destroy the Bible. If at one time you had a Bible and were caught with the Bible, you were tortured to death, uh, and uh, you, maybe your family with you. Uh, it was critical. God wrote it. We saw it happen, of course. This is looking at the apostles and Jesus, and, he, and they're saying, uh, God had us write the Bible, but we saw him in action. Uh, the Bible states that there was 500 people saw Jesus after the resurrection. 500. Uh, that's, that's evidence it's in itself that he existed, and he was alive after his death on the cross. The Old Testament, what is it? The law. There's five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And that's what I was telling you. That's the Pentateuch. That's, the, that's what they heard every seven years. But as time went on, we got the history books, uh, Joshua, Judges, uh, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. The poetry books. There's five books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Then we had the prophets, the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel and the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Malachi was the last book of the Old Testament. There was approximately 32 writers covering 3,600 years of man's time. Uh, when we look at this, 32 writers and I said originally there was 40 writers that wrote the, New, the Bible. Well, there's eight writers that wrote the New Testament, and there's 32 writers that wrote the Old Testament. And we look at uh, how many books. Uh, this is kind of an easy way to remember how many books are in the Old Testament, because if you take Old Testament and you count Old, one, two, three, and Testament, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, three and nine, you put them together and you have 39 books in the Old Testament. And same principle works for the New Testament because if you change old to new, you still have three and you have Testament nine. But here you go three times nine is 27. 27 books in the New Testament, uh, 39 books in the Old Testament, a total of 66 books making one Bible. How can we know the Bible is true? Science. The Bible is not a book of science, yet when it speaks on science, it has never been found to be in error. Uh, examples of this. Isaiah 40, 22, the earth is round, not flat. <laughs> For so many years, think of Christopher Columbus. They thought that the world was flat, but Christopher Columbus says, no, I believe it's round, and he set out to prove it, but we're looking at the fact that the Bible says that the earth is round, not flat. Psalm 19, 1 through 6, 
the sun travels on the circuit. It's amazing how it talks about the fact that uh, uh, things that people didn't understand or know, but the Bible talked about the sun is on a circuit. It, it rotates. Uh, Job 26.7, the earth has an invisible support. It's called gravitation. And it was spoken about in Job, but uh, God had that written in his words. Ecclesiastic 1.7, the whole matter of rain and evaporation. Uh, how would people clear back in the Old Testament times have an understanding of that, but here the, the Bible brings it out. So again, the Bible is not a, a science book, but anything it says about science, 100% correct. The Bible books are remarkably free of myths. I've heard so many people say there's myths in the Bible. No, not one. Now, uh, some of them have what you call an apocrypha. They've added some books to the Bible uh, that do not belong there. There are some myths, fables, there's some things in there, but again, that is not the Word of God. The Apocrypha is not the Word of God. That's additional books that some religions have added to the Bible, and of course, uh, in error. Fictitious stories, people, or things. Okay, unsophisticated scientific inaccuracies of their contemporaries. For example, now, <laughs> the earth hatched from an egg. Prior to coming to truth, I was an evolutionist. I, my degree was in botany, my bachelor degree was in botany, but um, evolution, I, was, I wanted to get into evolution. A lot of my classes dealt with paleobotany, the study of uh, rocks and fossils. And when you see this, the earth hatched from an egg, uh, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. And he grew up with the greatest training there could be in uh, the time that he lived. That was, uh, he lived in the palace. He, he, he was trained by the best. And he was taught evolution. That's one of the things that he was taught. The earth uh, was hatched from an egg, and men came from worms in the Nile River. Uh, again, <laughs> evolution was even taught back in those days. Totally incorrect. Any science book over a few years old becomes obsolete. Uh, science constantly changes. The Word of God never changes. Science. Now we look at medicine. The book, None of These Diseases by uh, S.I. McMillan, M.D., shows many plagues and diseases of mankind uh, could have been avoided if God's Word would have been read. Uh, I've read that book many times. It's interesting how different plagues and diseases that came on mankind and how many thousands and thousands and thousands, some, some cases almost a million people died. If they had looked in the Bible, the Bible gave the answer to the plague or disease and how to stop it. But again, uh, people weren't looking at the Bible. In the early 1700s, the science of medicine was revolutionized. And when, when I'm saying the 1700s, well, we're in the uh, 2000, just not too much time, a few thousand years from that time. But there was a scientist, William Harvey, found that life is in the blood. Over 3,000 years earlier in the book of Leviticus, Moses said the same thing. Uh, George Washington. How did he die? They were draining his blood from his body. They had a bow and uh, they were, you could see the blood going over into the bow. Well, they took too much blood out of him and he died. It was after that that they learned that life is in the blood. You keep the blood in the body. The blood is, an impo is important. And through time, because of that discovery, life is in the blood, we have seen multiple changes in the medical world where we have things today that are unbelievable. Uh, uh, what do you call it? An antibodies, different things like that that can help us uh, defeat diseases that come on us and uh, talk about it's the Word of God. Life is in the blood. 
How can we know the Bible is true? Well, we look at history and we look at archaeology. Historical accuracy. In the Bible we find countless references to historical events, people and places. The confirmation of archaeology to the truthfulness of the Bible is one of the amazing developments of modern time. In archaeology, a thousand silent witnesses have been brought to life to testify to the truth of God's Word. The Bible says that if men did not praise Him, the rocks would cry out. They're crying out today. Confirming evidence has been found for the creation of all man, the flood, the Tower of Babel, the Hebrews, bondage in Egypt and Mount Sinai and many other events, people, and places. <laughs> I bold, put Mount Sinai in bold print so that you could see it easily, but uh, it's amazing. For years, people says there's not a bit of evidence at Mount Sinai that any, well, two to three million people came there. Uh, some had to die. There's no graveyards. There's no evidence one bit of evidence that Moses brought the people out of uh, Egypt and brought them down to Mount Sinai. But uh, today we do have evidence. Well, one thing is, uh, let me tell you this, that I was in Israel. And when I was in Israel, I picked up a brochure. It was uh, tours that they had. And they says, one of six places they believe is Mount Sinai. I go, what? They don't know where Mount Sinai is? And... I got studying and all that, and we look at the Sinai Peninsula, and Mount Sinai was down at the very bottom of the Sinai Peninsula. It was a place where two or three million people couldn't camp. It was high mountains. It, it was uh, totally, it was impossible, okay? So uh, the thing is, that wasn't Mount Sinai. They got the wrong place. Uh, there is a place now that's in Saudi Arabia. And, of course, when you're looking at Mount Sinai, again, you're looking at Mount Sinai. The Red Sea goes here, but the Red Sea also goes on this side. They crossed over Mount, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, got to the Red Sea, crossed over, and Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. Um, Paul says uh, Mount Sinai is in Arabia. The evidence that is there. It's unbelievable. The, the top of the mountain has been burned. There's pillars there that Moses had. There's, uh, there's a, um, uh, what am I trying to say? There's an altar built there, and the rocks on it, they have Egyptian bowls carved into it. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, someone had to come from Egypt to come over and do that. There's graveyards there. There's a place where the rock will opened up and, and water flowed out. There's caves there where uh, Elijah came later and he was in a cave. And we'll, uh, look at one after another of different things that uh, Mount Sinai, there's evidence today. Uh, I'm going to stop at this point, and we're going to pick up this lesson next week because uh, I want to take the time with it, and it's very important. We thank you, Lord, for your presence, for being with us. Help us, Lord, in your name to understand the importance of the Word of God because there is something else here that you want us to share it with others. You want us to reach for souls. That's another commandment that you've put out. Help us to do your will in your name. Amen.